As you're getting seated, I invite you, as we do each week, to open your Bible with me to Psalm 73. If you don't have a Bible with you this morning, we do have Bibles right underneath the pews, and you can pull one of those out. And turn to Psalm 73. Uh, If you are just joining us for the first time this morning, or if it's been a number of weeks since you've been here, over the course of this summer, we have been working through a series where we're looking at different psalms in the Bible. It's called Summer in the Psalms, and we're calling it that because it's the summer and we're looking at psalms. It's really creative. Um, So (laughs) um, we've looked at a lot of different psalms this summer. And uh, this week and next week will be our final weeks of this series before we change gears and start the fall together. But this morning we're going to be looking at Psalm 73 together. So I invite you to follow along with me as I read Psalm 73. Hear now the word of the Lord. Truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For they have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. They are not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. Therefore, pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes swell out through fatness. Their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and speak with malice. Loftily, they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens, and their tongues struts through the earth. Therefore, his people turn back to them and find no fault in them. And they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease, they increase in riches. All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. If I had said, I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I discerned their end. Truly, you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors. Like a dream when one awakes, O Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast toward you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works." Let's pray together. Almighty God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you that no matter what else may be going on in our lives, we can come to your word, O Lord, and hear you speak to us. And that your word which goes out never returns void, but accomplishes exactly that which you purpose it. And so, Lord, we ask that this morning you would accomplish your will in our lives Do your work upon our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to ask you, what do you do when there seems to be a conflict with the truth that you believe about God and your experience of what you see in the world? Probably all of us at one time or another have had that, that experience of seeing something in the world, seeing something happening around us or maybe in our own lives that just does not seem consistent with the truth that God has revealed about himself in his word. And the question is, what do we do when we encounter that kind of conflict? I want to tell you that that is exactly the kind of conflict that Asaph, the writer of this psalm, is dealing with in Psalm 73. Asaph was a singer. He was one of the leaders in Israel. He was a worship leader for Israel. And he starts Psalm 73 by declaring a truth that he knows to be true about God. He says in Psalm 73, 1, truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. That's a statement of truth. Truly God is good to Israel, 
to those who are pure in heart. That's what he starts off with in verse 1. Now that's something he knows to be true. He has read about that in the scriptures. He has probably sung about that in worship. He's probably taught other people about that truth at different points in his life. And yet, that truth about God, this goodness of God, comes into conflict for him with something that he sees, something that he saw when he looked at the world around him. Look at verse 2 with me. Verse 2 says, But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Asaph looked at the world and he saw something. And what he saw created a conflict for him. It created an internal conflict for him. And what I want to do is I want to look first at what that conflict was. And, and this conflict was the first thing that he saw was that the wicked often prosper. When he looked at the world around him, he saw, I'm seeing around me that the wicked are often prospering. He says he saw the prosperity of the wicked. He says he saw that people are not doing good. They're not following God, and instead of suffering, they're often prospering. He says, first of all, they live life without troubles. Verse 4, for they have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. Now, you've got to understand something for a minute. You probably read that and think, well, fat. I mean, that doesn't sound real good. Uh, <laughs> what's he talking about here? But he's talking about being well-fed, that they have everything that they need, that their bodies are, are not emaciated, or they're not suffering or struggling. They've got everything that they need. Their bodies are fat and sleek. They're not in trouble as others are. Are. They're not stricken like the rest of mankind. Now, this seems like a, a contradiction for Asaph because he knows his scriptures well. The scriptures say that the man or woman who follows the law of the Lord will be blessed. Psalm 1 says, blessed is, is the man who, who, who follows and delights in the law of the Lord. Meanwhile, uh, he says, the, Psalm 1 tells us that not only will those who follow the law of the Lord be blessed and prosperous, but those who don't will be cursed and will uh, be blown away like chaff in the wind. But sometimes that's hard to believe, isn't it? When you look at the world around you. And you see what Asaph saw. You see that, well, I see lots of people, the, the, the wicked often prospering. They seem to live life without any troubles. He says another thing. He says they commit evil without consequences. Verse 5 says, therefore pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes swell out through the fatness. Their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and speak with malice. Loftily they threaten oppression. He's seeing the fact that there's people who commit evil and don't seem to suffer any consequences for that. You know, on numerous occasions, I've had the experience of driving on the interstate and... Why are you laughing already? <laughs> Is my driving that bad? Uh, of driving on the interstate... And having somebody almost mow me down going like 100 miles an hour. And I got to tell you, in that moment, um, some really not good thoughts go through my head. And, uh, and one of them is, is that uh, sometimes when that happens, I pray, oh Lord, I pray that there is a speed trap ahead <laughs> so that this maniac can get what he deserves and that I can laugh as I go by and wave at him. The Lord never seems to answer that prayer, though. <laughs> I don't know why, but the Lord never seems to answer that prayer. And so instead, I find myself saying, Oh Lord, how long will the wicked go unpunished? Now that's just a silly example, right? But of course, we could talk about many more, much more serious examples. We look at the world and there are, are scammers who swindle people out of money. Sometimes who swindle people out of their life savings and they never get caught. There are traffickers who enslave women and children and they're never brought to justice. You look around the world today and there are people who persecute Christians in mass and sometimes even kill Christians and yet nothing ever happens to them. They commit evil without consequences. And this is what Asaph is seeing when he looks at the world and it's creating this conflict for him. I thought God was good to his people. And yet I see the wicked prospering. They, they not only live life without troubles, they commit evil without consequences. He also says they, they mock God without any qualms. Verse 9 
says, they set their mouths against the heavens. Their tongue struts through the earth. Therefore, his people turn back to, to them and find no fault in them. And they say, how can God know? There, is there knowledge in the Most High? Now, Asaph is talking about people who openly mock God. And yet, they don't have any qualms about it. And God doesn't seem to be doing anything about it. You know, sometimes people make jokes today about, uh, you know, don't say that or you might get struck with lightning from heaven, right? There's, there might be a lightning bolt from heaven if you say certain things. The question I want to ask is, what happens when the lightning bolt doesn't come? Because that's what Asaph is talking about. Here's people who are mocking God and uh, maybe deserve a good shock, <laughs> but the lightning bolt never comes. And they mock God without any qualms. They go on living their comfortable lives. Look at verse 12. This verse 12 is a summary of the first part of his conflict. He says, behold, these are the wicked always at ease. They increase in riches. When he looks at the world, he says, I see these people who do not follow or honor God and they seem to be prospering. But that's only part of his conflict when he looked at the world. The other part, the other half of the conflict was that he saw that the righteous often suffer. The wicked often prosper, the righteous often suffer. Verse 13 says, he says, All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. Now, think about this for a minute. He, what, what's going on here is he's not just struggling because he looks at the world and sees that the wicked are often prospering. He's also in conflict because he looks at the world and he sees that the righteous, those who do seek to follow God, are often suffering. And it's as if he's saying, Lord, I know, back to verse 1, that truly you are good to your people, and yet I'm looking at the world and it seems hard for me to believe. He even wonders if, if his efforts to live a godly life, have they all just been in vain, Lord? Was it all a waste? That seems harsh, but I bet many of you sitting here could relate to that. Many of us struggle when we encounter troubles in the real world, and we are tempted to believe that maybe our efforts to live a godly life have been in vain. So we say things to ourselves or to God like, Lord, why did you bring disaster into my life when I'm doing my best to live for you? Is, is, are all of my efforts, have they just been in vain? Lord, why did I get passed up for a promotion at work when I'm the only person in my workplace with any integrity? <laughs> Everybody else is just trying to uh, uh, do uh, schemy things and, and, and get ahead, and I'm the only one who has integrity, and yet I'm getting passed up and the others are getting ahead. Lord, have all of my efforts at integrity just been in vain? Or we say, Lord, uh, why is it that my children have wandered away from you? When I did my absolute best to raise them in the faith, and, and, and I did everything I could to disciple them, but they're, they're not following you. Have all of my efforts at being faithful as a parent, have they all been in vain? Sometimes we look at the real world, and it feels like all we see is the wicked prospering and the righteous suffering. And so we wonder, like Asaph, have I kept my heart clean in vain? This was the conflict that he was having. And I want you to see that the conflict began to have two effects on him. First of all, as we already saw, he became envious of the wicked. Verse 3 says, I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. You know, sometimes it's easy to look at those who don't follow God and say, you know what? Their life seems a lot more desirable than mine. <laughs> they seem to be having a lot more fun. They seem to be having a lot more prosperity. And so we can begin, if we're not careful, to allow envy to take hold in our hearts. But he didn't just become envious of the wicked. He also became bitter toward God. Verse 21 says, when my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast toward you. If we aren't careful, envy will begin to grow into bitterness toward God. And we will begin to question God's goodness. We'll, we'll say to ourselves, Lord, if you are so good, why haven't you been good to me? That was the place in which Asaph found himself. This is a very honest psalm. Psalms are real. 
And that was the place he found himself. Thankfully, he didn't remain in that place. And that's what I want you to see this morning. And that he had this major conflict, but there also was a resolution to that conflict. In verse 16, it says, But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I discerned their end. Now I want you to notice something. Asaph went to the sanctuary. He went to the place of the temple. And it was at that place that he found his resolution. Why was it at that place? He doesn't really uh, give us the answer. He doesn't tell us in detail. But you remember the sanctuary was the place where God's people came together to meet him and meet one another to worship the Lord and hear the Lord speaking to them, to hear his word spoken to them. And I would suggest to you that it was only when Asaph shifted his focus from all of the troubles he saw in the world to God and his sanctuary that then he was able to regain his footing. And that's an important lesson in and of itself today. You know, sometimes when we are feeling confused spiritually or downcast or depressed, the temptation is to cut ourselves off from God's people. So I don't want to go to church. I just don't feel up to it. I don't want to hear anything. I just don't feel happy. I don't want anybody to try to make me feel happy. Or I'm confused, and so I'm just going to take some time away. That's probably the worst thing we could possibly do. Because, as Asaph shows us, it is at the sanctuary, it's at the place where people would meet with God and meet with one another, that, that he received his answers. Doesn't mean he received the answers he was looking for. Oftentimes, the answers we get are not the answers we were looking for, but they are the answers that we need. And that is why we have to take his example here. He was weary with confusion, and he was very downcast until he went to the sanctuary of God. And what did he discover when he went to the sanctuary? Two things become apparent. First of all, he saw that the wicked are far from God and will be even farther in eternity. Look at verse 18. It says, Truly, you set them, he's talking about the wicked now, in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors, like a dream when one awakes. O Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. And then he goes on. If you go down to verse 27, he sort of summarizes his conclusion. He says, for behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. When Asaph went to the sanctuary to be near to God, he recognized that the wicked, as, in spite of the fact that they may seem to be prospering in the world, they are far from God. And that's a very important point. Because what he is realizing here is that despite having everything else that they might have, they don't have the thing that matters most. And that is a relationship with their creator. And if you don't have a relationship with your creator, I said this last week, if you don't have a relationship with your creator, then nothing else that you have is of any value. Jesus said, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and to lose his soul? The answer is nothing. You could have everything in the world, literally everything. You could amass the wealth of every single country and every single billionaire on this planet. You could amass all of that wealth and have all of it, and it would be worth absolutely nothing if you didn't have your creator. And he's recognizing something here. Okay, they may seem to be prospering, but... They are far from God, and they do not have the thing that matters most. Not only are they far from God, but they will be even farther in eternity. The Bible says that those who are far from God, meaning they do not believe in God or seek God or honor God, if they don't turn to God in faith and repentance, will be separated from God for an eternity and suffer eternal judgment. And so he's recognizing, remember what he says? I went to the sanctuary and then I discerned their end. Despite all the prosperity, he's bringing something into focus here. And he's realizing that none of that really matters. Because those individuals are far from God and are going to be even farther in eternity. And then he also recognizes something else. And that is that the righteous are close to God and will be even closer in eternity. 
Verse 23 says, Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will receive me to glory. Asaph recognized a couple of things. He recognized God had always been with him. In all the trials, in all the troubles, in all the tribulations, he recognized the Lord, you have been with me, and, and you've held my right hand. And sometimes when we suffer, we're tempted to believe the lie that God is not with us. And we think that the presence of suffering in our lives means the absence of God. Asaph is, is seeing something else. He's re realizing that suffering does not mean God is absent. God has been with him through all of his troubles and trials and tribulations. And he didn't just recognize that God had been with him, but he recognized that one day he would be with God in heaven. He says, you will receive me into glory. And so the great promise for those who trust in God is that it's not just that he is with us in this life, but that we will be with him in heaven forever, which is that, that truth which gives us strength to get through whatever trials we face in this world. Paul says this uh, suffering that we encounter, this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. That's consistent with what Asaph was saying here. And essentially what Asaph saw when he went to the sanctuary is this great reversal that takes place in the context of eternity. Those who have chosen to forsake God now will find when they get to eternity that their best days are behind them. Meanwhile, those who have chosen to trust God now when they get to eternity will find that their best days are ahead of them. Christian author by the name of Randy Alcorn put it this way. He said, the best of life on earth is a glimpse of heaven. The worst of life on earth is a glimpse of hell. For Christians, this present life is the closest they will come to hell. For unbelievers, it is the closest they will come to heaven. That's the great reversal that Asaph is seeing and that's coming into focus here. It was the thing that resolved this conflict, uh, but it wasn't the only thing. He also came to another realization that's really profound and that I want you to see. It's the realization that every believer, I, I think, must come to, and that is the realization that ultimately God is all we really need. Look what he says in verse 25. He says, Whom have I in heaven but you, and there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you? My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Now, I, want, I, I once heard somebody say, you don't realize that God is all you need until God is all you have. And when we get to the place where everything else in life has fallen away, everything else has failed, everything else has crashed and burned, and God is all we have left. We've got two options at that point. We can curse God and we can say, God, why haven't you given me my desires? Or we can say to God, Lord, you are all I desire. You are all I need. I need you alone. My heart and my flesh may fail. Everything else may be taken away, but you, Lord, are the strength of my heart and my portion forever. That was the place that Asaph came to. The Lord is worthy of our praise, not because of what he can give us, but because of who he is. Charles Spurgeon wrote these words. He said, after having been driven far out to sea, Asaph casts anchor in the old port. We shall do well to follow his example. There is nothing desirable save God. Let us then desire only him, all other things must pass away. Let our hearts abide in him who alone abideth forever. You know, those words are an important reminder as we read this psalm because you could read this psalm and come to the wrong conclusion. It would be easy to misunderstand Psalm 73 and some believers might read this psalm and, and, and uh, become kind of smug and think that the message of this psalm is that God is going to give the wicked what they deserve and they're going to get what's coming to them and we can take delight in that. <laughs> and that's not the message, the primary message of this psalm. In fact, uh, God's people are not called to take delight in the fact that anyone is far from God, but rather 
We are called to pray for those who are far from God, that they would wake up and turn to God before it is too late. So the primary message is not a message about taking delight in the judgment of the wicked. It's a message about taking delight in the goodness of God and in his goodness alone. When we realize that God is our portion, it enables us to face all these hardships that come with living in the real world because we recognize that we can be satisfied in God alone and that he is all we need and that it is enough for us to have him with us. It's enough that he is with us and that one day we will be with him forever. Not only is God's goodness this truth that sustains us in the world, but I want you to see as we close today that it's a truth that we can't help but share with the world. And that's precisely what Asaph desires to do at the end of this psalm. Verse 28, look at it with me. It says, but for me, it is good to be near to God. That's all he needs. But for me, it is good to be near to God. I have made the Lord God my refuge. And then he ends by saying, that I may tell of all your works. When God becomes our portion, we cannot help but tell of how good he is in and of himself. And so I close with one more word from Spurgeon. He said, God's ways are the more admired, the more they are known. He who is ready to believe the goodness of God shall always see fresh goodness to believe in. And he who is willing to declare the works of God shall never be silent for lack of wonders to declare. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are good. That your goodness endures forever that truly you are good to those who seek you, who take refuge in you. And Lord, we recognize that, and we confess to you that sometimes we struggle to believe that, just like Asaph. And so, Lord, help our unbelief. In the moments where we struggle to believe these truths, help us to believe, and more than that, help us to recognize that you are our portion. You are the strength of our hearts and our portion forever. May this be true, O oh Lord, this day and every day until that great day when you call us home. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.